Hi, my name is Brandon and I'm an alcoholic and addict in recovery. And today I'm going to talk about why quitting and getting sober from your drug of choice also includes getting sober and staying sober from all other drugs that might change the way that you view and experience the world. Taking some of this from Living Sober, which is centered around alcoholism, but this applies to all drugs. And so I'm going to tell a little bit of my own personal story, tell a little bit about what I've heard from other people, and then read some from the book. I quit drinking almost four years ago, but I continued to smoke pot because I didn't think that that was my problem. I felt like alcohol was the problem for me. That's what I needed to quit. And that's what was causing all of the issues that I was having in my life. But as time went on, my marijuana use started to look a lot like my alcohol use to the point where I became very, very dysfunctional in that situation as well. And all of a sudden I was dealing with the fact that it wasn't the drug I was using that was the problem. It was the addiction that was the problem. So it wasn't what I was using, it was that I was using in the first place. And I needed to get all psychological drugs out of my life. Um, and so that's why I came into recovery. Um, I've accepted the fact that I can no longer use any uh, mood altering substance at all uh, in, in my life. And, um, you know, the exception for me is coffee. I do drink coffee and people argue now that coffee is a mood altering substance. Um, you know, there have even been times though, I'll be honest, where I've thought, man, the way I drink coffee looks a lot like an addiction. And maybe I need to consider uh, whether or not I should remove this from my life as well. Not, not there yet. Uh, but the point is, is that we have to look honestly about what we're doing with any mood altering substance. And for people who are using, one of the things that I've heard a lot in recovery from other people is people who are using drugs like meth. Um, I've heard a lot of people say, my problem is meth, not alcohol. I can drink a few beers and be okay. Um, but whenever meth is involved, that's, that's when I get into a problem. And so um, the people that I know who have gone out and uh, taken to drinking after getting sober from a drug like meth or uh, crack cocaine or heroin have typically eventually gone back to using their original drug. And I, I think the, the fact of the matter is that we are addicts. It doesn't matter whether our addiction is alcohol or meth or crack or pot or opiates, anytime we engage in using a mood altering substance, we open ourselves up to one, potentially becoming addicted to that substance, and two, returning to use of our previous drug of choice. So that is really important for us to remember. And I want to read a little bit about what they say about that here. Um, so uh, from the book, it says, so we go to great lengths to avoid all commonly abused drugs, such as marijuana, meth, barbiturates, crack, cocaine, oxycodone, Vicodin, acid, tranks, ecstasy, heroin, poppers, and even many over-the-counter remedies and herbal supplements. Even to those of us who never got hooked on any of them, it is clear that they represent a potential danger, for we have seen it demonstrated over and over and over again. Drugs will often reawaken the old craving for oral magic or some kind of high or peace. And if we get by with using them once or twice, it often seems ever so much easier to pick up a drink or to pick up that old drug that you tried to quit. The Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is not an anti-drug or anti-marijuana lobby. 
As a whole, we take no moral or legal position either for or against any other substance. Every member of AA, though, is entitled, like any other adult, to hold any opinion on these matters and to take any action that seems right to him or to her. So, it's important to realize that, uh, you know, at I'm not saying that other people can't use these drugs. Uh, I'm saying I can't use these drugs. And I'm saying I can't use any drug without increasing a likelihood that I will go back to using the drugs that I've tried to quit and that I, I've so far quit successfully. Um, it's also really important to recognize the dangers of, especially with, with opiates the way they are these days, the dangers of pain medication and we have to be honest with the medical professionals we're working with in any situation about our history of drug and alcohol abuse so they know what they can and can't prescribe to us and I'm telling you guys sometimes you have got to tell your doctors do not prescribe me narcotics do not prescribe me opiates and be very upfront with them about what you want in your body. Because sometimes doctors, pain management is a very, very difficult field. And, uh, and it's, it's hard for doctors to navigate. It's a, extremely challenging for doctors to navigate. Um, and so sometimes you as a patient may need to say, I do not want I'm willing to put up with the pain because anything stronger than just a regular ibuprofen could trigger me to go back to using and, and I can't, the pain is worth dealing with um, and uh, rather than going back to my drug of choice. So be willing to take that step and be willing to say that to your doctors and most of all, be honest with them and work with them and be open with them. You know, I will tell you that when I was one of my first experiences with a mood altering drug that I loved was when I was in high school and I got mono and strep at the same time. And it was a terrible, terrible illness. My throat got so raw that it was, it felt like it was on fire and it, and it closed up very tightly. And I was in extreme pain and discomfort. And I was given a uh, liquid codeine to, to help with that. And boy, did it help. Um, I took that liquid codeine and I felt great. And I didn't really pay much attention to it at the time, but in hindsight, it certainly stands out to me that there were times where I was watching the clock to see when my next dose would come up because I was that excited about getting the next dose. And I enjoyed the feeling that it gave me. And I know now that if I'm ever in a similar situation, I can't take a drug like that. There, there is, there is no way I can take a drug like that. It's got to be something different, something that doesn't alter my mood in order for me to avoid a situation where I'm potentially getting addicted to a new drug or going back to use of an old drug. So really important to be honest with medical pr practitioners about these things. And then I'll read this last section from the, um, from the book. The chemical magic we felt from alcohol or substitutes for it was all locked within our own heads anyhow. Nobody else could share with could share the pleasant sensations inside us. Now we enjoy sharing with one another in AA or with anybody outside AA our natural undoped happiness. In time the nervous system becomes healthy and thoroughly conditioned to the absence of mood altering drugs. When we felt more comfortable without them than we felt while we were using them, we come to accept and trust our normal feelings, whether high or low. Then we have the strength to make healthful, independent decisions, relying less on impulse or the chemically triggered urge for immediate satisfaction. We can see and consider more aspects of a situation than before, can delay gratification for the sake of more enduring long-term benefits, and can better weigh not only for our own welfare, but also that of others we care for. Chemical substitutes for life simply do not interest us anymore now that we know what genuine living is. 
And that would be my message to anybody who is thinking, um, talk to a young man last night who, uh, who, you know, was really struggling with the idea of never using any kind of mind altering substances for the rest of his life. And I identify so much with that, but I would encourage anybody who's in that situation to understand that once you get past your addiction and once you get some time in recovery and once you get an opportunity to let your brain heal from what you've done to it, you will start seeing that the magic that you felt from getting high was there all along. It's in your brain already. Your brain can already do all the stuff that it was doing while you were getting high but you can do it without getting high and without the terrible consequences that you get from getting high and there is so much magic in sober living that i never expected to see that it's important to realize that no substitute for your drug of choice is worth potentially wrecking your life and going back to the kind of using that brought you to recovery in the first place. Hope y'all have a great day. I'll be back here with more tomorrow.